Hello, hello, guys. Welcome to our next episode in uh, SolidWorks. Um, I did some cleaning up from the last time I recorded, and uh, now we're going to move on to the next phase, which is getting some automatic system functions finally, so that you guys can see the power of, uh, well, I don't want to call it the power of, but like how we're actually going to add functionality to our code. So, so far we have all this randomization going on here and uh, we, I ordered the systems for us. What we have here on the left in this square is going to be the inputs that we put in. And then this is the output array so far. And then this is the analysis tools that we have set up right here, right? So these analysis tools, I give it a column and a row, and then it will tell me at that point, so whichever one of these, so let's say this point is going to give us this column, this row, and this section, and then it's going to identify with those and uh, and basically work with us to solve the, the Sudoku puzzle. Now, um, something interesting about what we're going to do next is that we need to create a way for the computer to identify that there is a point where there is a point that is ready for uh, that we have 100% certainty that there's a number that goes there and how do we do that. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take just our first row as our example. I'm going to set the last one to zero. So basically it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Then that is a 100% guarantee that this point right here should be a nine, right? Now, how do we get the computer to know this? Uh, instead of the number nine, I'm going to set the number four to zero, right? So now we have one, two, three, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I'm going to ignore everything else going on in here. These numbers are obviously, they do not uh, uh, they don't apply to the conventional Sudoku rules, especially because like this column here has has one six, two six, three sixes, and three fours, where it should have only one of each. We'll go ahead and worry about that another time. So, how do we get the system to know whether or not a point is ready for uh, is ready for an, an I don't want to call it an answer. But, well, yeah, ready for an answer, that works. What I am going to do is I'm going to set up a new array with the sole purpose of holding the empty point, and I'm calling it empty point data for now. And then we'll see how that progresses with the code. What I mean is that, for example, every point, let's say at this zero point that we have here, right? And then this one, let's go ahead and set it for now. This is going to be point one, two, three, four. So that's x3, row zero. That should be this zero point, and I'm going to run it. There we go. Um, that's an interesting feature. How about we get that data to ourselves right here? So let's go ahead and set up one more output. Um, Let's see, we're going to have to use this thing. There it is. And what we're going to have to set is these two will both need to be set to one because we only want that one digit. And the X for that will be the same as this. And the Y for that will be the same as that. Or the Y and X, the other way around. And then that's going to give us a, let's see, it's going to give us a uh, 2D array, which I actually only want a number. I don't even want the array, and I know where that number is. So I'm going to index it out of the out of the data. There we go. And uh, this should index that number alone. Oh, no, that's not working. Let's see. Can we index row and column? Can I say indicate? No, not indicator. Create a constant. Zero. Yep. Can I do that for both of these? There we go. Create indicator now. Oh, create indicator. There we go. It is an element. It is just a number. There, I'm going to put it right there. 
and I'm gonna make this smaller and I'm gonna get rid of the label there it is and now it should give us a zero when I run it and indeed it's a zero uh, for testing I'm gonna put a four and run it again it should give us four it's now four but we want it to be zero we want the computer to automatically figure out that this one should be and can be a four um, <clears throat> So that's going to be the first thing that we need to uh, handle in today's... Well, I'm not sure if I should call these, uh, what we're doing here, tutorials, but this project that we're working on right now, because that's, that's what this project is. I'm going to move these away, because these are the results. There we go. Um, I don't want to move things too close to each other, because... I'm pretty sure we're going to have to use them independently in the future. All right, so what are we going to do? What we're going to do now is we're going to create a really huge, and I'm calling it huge, a really huge array that is holding the uh, information available at every single point. So what we're, every point can be... 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So each point here can only be from 1 to 9. So what I need to do is I need to create an array that goes from 1 to 9. So I'm going to initialize an array. That's one way of doing it. Now, this is not the way I want to do it, but I'm going to show you one way of doing it. Actually, no, I'm not. I'm just going to show you how the, the right, more, um, more correct way of doing it would be is to come here a structure and I'm going to create a for loop now for loops are dangerous if you don't know how to work with them luckily I know how to work with them so what a for loop does and this is the first structure we're going to be discussing is it's going to do whatever is inside the square n number of times and then stop that's literally what the for loop does it's just like the for loop in C but has some minor differences. First, what I need to do is set how many times I want to repeat this. And I want to repeat it 10 times, right? Now, basically now this square right here is going to repeat 10 times. And throughout this 10 times, each time this i is going to increment. So first it's 0, then it's 1, then it's 2, then it's 3 all the way up to 10, which this is i minus 1, so this will be, the last number out of here will be 9. Now, I want to add just a 1 to it, and there's an incremental step here I can use, which gives me that as just that 1. And there's a pretty cool feature in LabVIEW that I need to discuss. I could talk a whole episode to explain it, but when I get this and put it on the edge, since this is a for loop, it's going to come out as an array. And let me show this to you. I'm going to create an indicator. And there it is. Here's our array. And I'm going to stretch it. And this array is now going to give me the numbers 1 through 9 when I run the code. And there it is. Oh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 7, 8, 9, 10. Oh, because I ran it 10 times. I need to run it 9 times. Sorry, guys. There we go. Runs up to 10 now. Now, what this little square thing does, now this has, there's three different things this could be. The way it looks right now with this two little squares makes this an auto index tunnel, which basically puts all the data in here every single time into an array. So the results are, are tracked. So every time this runs, I track the results of this line each time and add them all up together into an array. So first time this ran, this was a 1. Second time, this was a 2. Third time, and so on, and so on, and so on. Uh, we could actually show you this with the highlight execution, uh, but I'm actually kind of scared of doing that because you will not actually see it here. But I could create an indicator in here, then you might be able to see it. Let's see. Let's run the code. There we go. So this is, now it's running all, all the other systems. So that's why I said the highlighting might be kind of annoying because it's slow, right? So now this has been, this was the first one to be complete and then this and then that is complete. And now we're here. 
the first number to go is going to come here. See, it's 3, it's 4, next one's 5, then 6, then 7, then 8. Here you see 8, 9, and then when it's done, it takes out all the data, the 1 through 10, and adds them into this array. So you get them all out. That's basically what we did right here. The for loop can do a lot of things, and this is also true in normal coding. But since we're doing lab view, uh, I will not get into a lot of details on how to use a for function in uh, normal code. But it is definitely one of the most essential and most used uh, things in code is the for loop. All right. So there we go. So now we have a thing, this small little thing that generates a one to nine system. Now the next thing I want to do is I want to set this as a system for every single point on this line. Um, I hope that does make some sense to you guys. And I'm hoping this will make even more and more sense as we uh, move along. So, I'm going to pretend that this is only for this point we specified, the 0, 3 point, and we'll go into explaining it further later on, right? All right, so I'm going to move this along with us to here. I'm going to move this view a little, and now I'm going to work in this quadrant over here. Oh, in this quadrant over here. Now, first of all, uh, we need to do a check. If this number right here, the number of specified, is zero, right, then this here should be entirely zeros. And that will be the way we tell the computer, the code, that this is an, a spot that is already filled in. So I'm going to come here to our comparison, and I'm going to check if this is equal to zero, right? So I want to check if this element is equal to, so this element is equal to a zero, and then that's going to give me something here that we haven't talked about yet, a boolean. So if I do an indicator, it's going to give me a true or false answer, and I'm making this bigger so you guys can see. And I'm going to run it. Oh, uh, turn off this. So it's green, it's true, because this is true, it is zero. This element is zero, it is true. Let me go ahead and use the fourth x here and run the code. The fourth one is false because this is a five, right? Go back to three and run it. It's true, very, very nice. Now, how do we use Boolean? There's many ways to use it. We can do a lot of things with it, but for now, what I'm going to do with it is I'm going to come here, back to comparison, and do a selection system. And basically, I want to have two different things happen if this is true and if this is false, right? Um, this is one way of doing this. Another way of doing it is to use another structure, the case structure. There we go. I'm making it bigger for so that this makes more sense. The case structure has, in this case, it has a true or false structure. This could be set up to take in any cases. It's not called a true or false structure. It's a case structure. So we can have cases like just a numeric case. If this is 1, if this is 2, if this is 3. It all depends on what you wire into this green question mark right here. And this is called the case selector. In this case, I want to take in this one, this true or false system. If it's true, if this is true, I will take the true case. If this is false, it will take the false case. Now, if this is zero, right, then our array should be entirely an array of 10 zeros, if it's true. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's create a, f a fully zeroed array. And that array would be this initialized array that we used earlier. The element we're going to use is zero. This will be a 1D array. And this 1D array will have a dimension size of 10. Right there, there it is. And now we take this, if we put it into here, this is the true case, and this will exit an array. And I'm going to create an indicator here, 
it will exit an array through this box and this array should be all zeros if it is true which it is in this case oh, okay so we have an error okay so this these squares are pretty much all going to be the same in this case it's a tunnel it's called a tunnel and it's blank because it's not complete to complete the tunnel we need to add something to the false case right in this case I want this to happen if it is false and I'm going to take oh, and I'm going to take this and put it here connect this to that and there we go now it's orange so in the true case give me all zeros in the false case give me a 1 to 9 true case all zeros false case 1 to 9 and it's going to show me the results right here so this is perfect so right now if I run it there we go one, two, three, four, oh, uh, again, I made the same mistake. This should be nine, not uh, ten. All right, so if this is zero, which is true, this will be all zeros, which is what we have. If we go to the fourth column, this will become five, which is false, and this will become all of it. All these here will become, um, uh, will become the one to nine numbers. So let's run that. There we go, one to nine. Right? If we go back to 3, and run it, we go back to this true, which is all zeros, and I'm going to do this one more time, going to 4, you see there the numbers 1 through 9. So, pretty cool, huh? Now, that's it for the true case. It's a very simple thing that we're going to want to happen because of it. Uh, I'm not going to get into too much detail. It's very important just to understand what this here is doing right this here sets it to zero that's the most important thing to understand here um, I will go to the false case and work with this case right now because in the false case we are gonna want a lot of things to happen so what do we want to happen first of all what this has shown us I want this to be the possibilities right I wanna figure out what are all the possibilities that can be here and how do we do that well, it's very simple. We do that by understanding what's going on here. So, the five, we have the rows, the row and the column, and the element itself. And what we're gonna need to do is we're gonna need to check each one of those until we find the point where um, these numbers are there or not there. So let's go ahead and do that, and hopefully you guys will understand what I mean. So I'm going to make this bigger so we can work in here. So we create a 1 through 9 system if this is false, right? It's complete in this case. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to have to eliminate from it the number that has already, that I'm sorry, the number that uh, it is as well as all the other numbers that are in the row or column of the same point. So I'm going to take in first the row information. And this is going to be very significant because if it works, it's just going to give us the right answer directly. So I'm going to take this data and enter it to this block. Now what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to, so this data through this line is this data, right? I'm going to have to go through it one by one. And for that, we can do a for loop. The easiest way is to do a for loop. Here's our for loop, and we're going to run this through this, right? Now, in this case, this is an input into the for loop, and using the auto-indexing, it will automatically unindex it. Therefore, I don't need to set an n, because it will do as many n's as it takes to complete this step, these arrays. So basically, it will do it nine times every single time. Now, every single time, what comes out of here, if I do an indicator, is a single number, not an array. So the first time this runs, it will run 1. The second time, 2. The third time, 3. Fourth time, 4, 5. And it will get every single number from here individually into the for loop. right? And the key word here is individually. Now, what do we need to do? What we need to do is now go to the array, and we're going to have to search the 1D array. Now, which 1D array and what's going on? So we're searching in this array right here, our 9 array. And I'm going to enter this into this block. 
And this also enters as an index. Now here, I'm going to have to use something called a shift register. Again, explaining these will take episodes and episodes. I'll try to do it simply. What a shift register does is that every time this cycles, what ends up happening is that the system will update the, the, the initial status here, right? So when this first enters, it's going to enter 1, 2, 3, 4, 7, 8, 9. Then I'm going to do something to it. And then I want this new one to come in here for the next uh, step. And then so on and so on. Um, perhaps I should do an episode to explain how this works. And maybe I will. For now, I'm going to have to stick to this. So this array goes into this 1D array. And now the next thing it asks us is, what am I looking for? Right. So I'm looking in this 1D array. I'm looking for an element. In this case, it's going to be the first element here. And then it tells me where do I want to start default is zero. So that's perfect. What comes out of this is going to be an index of elements, right? Uh, an index of the element. So basically it tells me where the element is, right? It doesn't tell me what it is. It tells me where it is, the location where this one is. And let's, let's go ahead and, uh, and do an indicator of what that would be. And there it is. Now, this indicator, you should notice, is going to run nine times. So it's only going to show us the last answer, right? Uh, and I'm going to have to connect this to that for this to work. There we go. Let me show you what that is. This is eight. So the location is the eighth location. This is basically the last one. So what this eight tells us is that the last number here is in the last position here. Uh, if I am to put the number four at the end here, right? And now run it, it will give me the location of this, which is zero, one, two, three. This should be three now. There it is, now it's three. Because this is, because, because this ran nine times, right? This for loop. So the data here is only the data of the last one, unless I take it out as a, uh, as, as we did here, I can get the information out as an array and look at them one by one, but I'm not going to do that. This will be the last piece of information because all previous data were not saved and it will give me the location in here. If it does not exist in here, so let's do, for example, the number 10, which does not exist in this one. Uh, let's run that. It gives you a minus one if it does not exist. Now, if it does not exist, that is totally fine. It's no problem. It does not mean there's anything wrong with our code yet. There we go. And again, this will be done for every single step. So now you understand what that index means. Now, all I am interested in is whether it finds it or not, right? And we're going to have to do a comparison for that. And then I want to check if this is less than zero and there's one there less than zero so this index i want to know if it's negative or not and then what i'm going to do is again we're going to come here and do a selection which i wanted to talk about but i didn't so i'm going to talk about it now so basically i want to do a different thing if this is true or false right if you look at the help this is the selector the s and then this t is the true case and the f is the false case and if it's true, the true case is connected. And if it's false, the false case is connected. So it's literally just like a switch, basically saying if I want the top part or the bottom part, the true face or the false case. So if this is true, what I will want is going to be, uh, is going to be this to continue as is, because it does not exist. So I don't care what happens. This connects to here. And to break the cycle, there we go. Everything is fine right now. The world is happy. There's no sadness and no wars. All right. Now, in the false case, this is where all the interesting things begin in the false case. And what we're looking for in the false case here is we're looking for taking away this location, right, from this here. 
Do you see that? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a replace array subset. And then which array? Obviously the array that we started off with, uh, which I can access from anywhere, basically. I'm going to have to access it from here. And then it tells us where the index. And the index is going to be this index. And then it's going to tell us to replace it with what. And I'm going to basically replace it with a zero. Um, I'm hoping I'm making some sense to you guys of what's going on here. So basically, and this is going to process through. Uh, and this data will go through to the next step. Um, so what have we done here, essentially? So what we have just basically done in this little code, in this little snippet right here, is we took a piece of information from our code and what we did to it was sorry I know, I know I'm breaking up I'm trying to figure out what would be a nice way of, uh, of setting these up and again this this thing that I do is completely irrelevant to the functionality of the code it's just to make it prettier alright so let's go through this step by step first we have the data of the 1 through 9 coming in and then we have the data here coming in one by one of this. What's going to happen is the data enters through this blue line, comes to this block, and at this block, it's going to have to make a search in this array. It's going to search for the first one, the number one. Now, if it finds it, it'll tell me where it is. And that number will be from zero to eight. If that number is negative, that means it didn't find it. If it didn't find it, that means I don't want to do anything. So this will be the area. If it's less than zero, which means negative one or any negative number, that means it didn't find it. And if it didn't find it, which is the true case, just take this, run it through, and come back and do this again. Now, in the case that it did find it, right, and this is false, which means that it found the number one at here location zero, what ends up happening is this bot this step here where we do a replace what we replace is we replace in this array the point where this number was found for example the we found the number one which was at point zero and we replace that with a zero right um if what i'm saying makes sense oh sorry control z let me break this line apart and connect this here now, if I have coded this correctly, which for uh, lack of embarrassment, I'm hoping I coded it correctly. Otherwise, this would be a very embarrassing moment. But if I coded this correctly, then what should happen when I run the program right now is this array should show me, in this specific case, should show me the number 4 only. And everything else will be zeros. There it is. Everything is zeros except the number four. And the reason that is, is because what happened is the code was able to find the number nine within its, uh, w was able to find all these other numbers. And it tells me now that this number, without a doubt, is 100. Now, if we try doing that for the, let's see, not this one, not this one, let's try doing it for this one right here right and that's gonna be the second y so zero one two um, what ends up happening now is that when I run this there's only a one four and seven here so the numbers one four and seven will be zero everything else will still be there oh what's happening here what this is true I think I made an error somewhere. Let's go back to the zero case. Ah, <laughs> I actually, I do have an error here. Okay, so I have these, uh, I have the cases, I have these cases mixed up. If it's zero, which is true, in the true case, I wanted to check for answers. So I need to switch these. So I'm gonna right click on this one 
and I can say make this case false. So now this is the false case and this is the true case. Nothing has changed except that there we go. So this point here, oh shit. When we do the analysis for this point right there, this point right there has to be a 4. Now when we do it for this point down here, we get the result. So basically it can't be, there's a 0 for the number 1 because it can't be a 1. It can't be a uh, 4 and it can't be a 7. But it could be any of the others. Now the next step would be to join, to, to do the same test for the horizontal and the section so that we can get a 100% answer on what that number, that single point could be. And that's what we're going to do here next. So the next step is going to be to adjust the input, uh, the input that is coming into this block, this line right here. That's what we're going to have to adjust right now. Because that line should give us because this line here should take the data from here, here, and here, and combine them, right? Um, so let's go ahead and do that. Um, first, I'm going to take the subarray that we have here, and I'm going to do something to it. I'm going to reshape it, as we did up here. I'm going to reshape this into a nine-dimensional number, well, nine-array uh, number. Uh, I mean, size 9, it's going to be a single array. Oh, you know what? I should keep this for reference. And then I'm going to have another one of these. There we go. So this, what I just did here, was I added an array that is going to look linear, but you should keep in mind this is not a linear one. And um, there we go. Here it is. This is the section converted. This is this converted into a single line. Let me run that for you guys. There it is. So that's 0, 5, 6, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 4. So this is converted into one line. Now I'm going to combine this line, this line, and this line together to get a complete array of uh, everything. Let's go ahead and do that array. And then, as we did before, we're just going to insert into this array. We insert into this one, this one right here, and this one right here. And then I'm going to create an indicator just to see if this array is correct. This should be a really long array. There it is. Now, why is it wrong? Why is it so long? Because it's these numbers, 001, 004, 007, 001, 004, 007. Then it's these numbers, 30, 41, 30, 41, 0400, 0400. And then these numbers, which is 056, 056, 0004, 0004. It's all these numbers. And all these numbers are going to be fed into this system to get the finalized answer, right? So I take all these numbers and I feed them into my system, which is checking for, uh, which is checking for the possible for all the possibilities. That's this system right here, and then giving me the array here, the finalized nine possibilities. And let's run that and see what happens for this one. There it is. It has eliminated a few others. What this just tells me right now is that the number at this point, 3, 2, which is this one, can be a 2, a 3, an 8, or a 9, and it can't be anything else. It can't be a 1, because there's a 1 here. It could be a 2, could be a 3. It can't be a 4, because there's a 4 here. It can't be a 5, because in this section, there's a 5. It can't be a 6, because in this section, there's a 6. It can't be a 7, because there's a 7 here. It could be an 8 and it could be a 9. If I am to come here and add the number 8 and come here and add the number 9 and come here and add the number 2, oh, come here and add the number 2, now I can tell you that this one will only be 3. And then I'm going to run it. This one can only be 3. Nothing else is there. They're all zeros except the 3, which is exactly what we want. Um, 
I just thought of something, but I don't want to do it necessarily because I'm afraid it might be wrong in a way. Um, so here's what I was thinking. What I was thinking is we can actually eliminate numbers as to only have the numbers left that are possible. But I'm thinking that in more uh, in more complex situations later on, we'll have to do a kind of comparison between things and that might become a little more difficult. Um, but then we can come here and fix this. So what I'm gonna do here, instead of replacing, I'm gonna do I'm going to replace this block with another block, and I'm going to replace it with this delete from array block, right? And then I don't need this anymore. What this tells me is which array, where do I want to delete? And that's going to be this one. That's the length. There we go. So I did a little adjusting to this code. Hopefully, I didn't confuse anyone. Well, I'm going to assume you guys are going to tell me that you're already confused and it doesn't matter, but it does matter. So now what we're doing is we're deleting all the zeros instead of replacing them with zeros, right? Remember when this was 1 through 9? Instead of replacing the 1 with a 0, I just delete it and everything moves up. So now when I run it, I should only get the number 3. There it is, only the number 3. If I go ahead and go to... The first block, no, let's do, well, let me get rid of this 8, this 1, oh, let's put zeros, and this 4, and this 9, and this 2. There we go. Now let's run it. It's left with the possibilities, which are 2, 3, 8, and 9. Those are the only possibilities. If I add a 9 here, for example, that possibility is off the table. If I add a 3 into the section, that's off the table. And, most importantly, if I... Uh, if I go ahead and put a number here, like uh, 5, this will give me all zeros. So let's go ahead and fix this so it gives me only one zero, telling me that this does not exist. So instead of creating an array, let's just take the number 0. Now, we cannot connect the number 0 to this line because it's incompatible with the array. The outputs need to be an array in this case. So I need to build an array. This is the easiest thing to convert a single number into a single array. There it is. So now what happens is it's going to send an array with the number 0. And this will be our indicator that there is there is a number already there. Let's run that. That gave us a 0. A 0 means that there is a number there already. Right? So let's go to, where are we? We're at, we're at uh, 3, 2. So that's 1, 2, 3, 1, 2. Let's go to 4, 2. And 4, 2 is going to look for possibilities now. And the only thing that could be here, apparently, is an 8. To prove this, the 1's right there, the 2's right there, 3, 4, 5, 6, the 7, and the 8's missing everywhere, and then there's the 9. So this is definitely an 8. Right? So this is definitely an 8. Um, yep, there we go. So I'm going to make this a little smaller. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. There we go. So these are the possibilities. This is the true false system, which we don't actually need this indicator anymore. We have worked with it. I'm going to go ahead and move here. And I'm going to adjust these for what some people call very silly this thing I do trying to get all the code cleaned up that's what I'm calling it at least for now so but I think it's awesome and very helpful in the future uh, we're gonna talk about sub VI's shortly in the future and uh, it will make some other things even simpler there we go so here's what we did today we took what we had and we added an extra piece of code to it. And that piece of code determines the possibility scape right here. So the possibilities are, the only possibility is an 8. So let's go ahead and run it again. The only possibility here is an 8. Uh, let's come and check this one, for example. and Or let's do something, let's do this one right here. 
so this one's going to be the point, uh, let's see, this is row 8, 7, 8, so x7, y8. I'm going to run it. And just to double check, you can see the section, 7, 8, 0, 0, 5, 0, 7. Uh, the row is 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 4, 5, 0, 7. And the column is 800, 800, 800, 800, 800, 800. So this is it. It's a 0. Possibilities here are 2, 3, 6. If I add a 3 here and I run it, possibility is only 2 and 6, right? And then if we add those somewhere, you get closer and closer to a single number. Um, next time, we'll take this and we will make, uh, well, we'll try to, I don't want to say complicate our system more, but I'm going to say we will add more functionality to our system, hopefully to make it make more sense. Uh, that will be all for today. I'm just going to stop this episode and we'll start a new episode. All right. All right, guys, I will talk to you guys in just, uh, well, on the next episode. <laughs> All right. Bye, guys.